hello everybody welcome to our workshop and my <laughs> colleagues <laughs> okay so what we are going to do today i sent already a link to the chat but i will send it once more is uh Sup quarkus superheroes application which is a set of maybe i can share it really quickly hopefully this will work so you should if you open the link, you will get into the same page that uh, I am in. Basically, this workshop is really written in a best possible way for you to go at your own self pace. So what we would prefer is actually for you to go uh, basically on your own and uh, just ask us when you will get stuck or you want us to explain something. However, if you would prefer, and please write this to chat to do this also on my screen so i will go with you step by step because i see that somebody is still in a bed uh then uh, i can do that for sure but uh really i would prefer personally to for you to go on your own pace because there is a lot of uh stuff that you need to do actually on your machine which uh, doesn't really make sense for me to show on my machine <laughs> Is if you can like see where I'm going. So I can then start maybe in half an hour if you prefer to really start coding the Quarkus applications themselves. So please write this to the chat. But for now, I would ask you to open that link that I sent to the chat and just go step by step and basically start with installing software section. So you have all necessary uh, built tools installed before we will proceed, because this is uh, really something that you need to have for us to finish that workshop successfully. Uh, I don't know if Martin or Vladislav want to say something. No, I think I agree. Um, there's a lot of like uh, preparatory steps that you need to need, need to follow, and and if you don't that if you, if you don't have all these all these tools yet um it wouldn't make much sense for anyone to like go go farther um so yeah <laughs> but really if you would like us to explain anything just write it to the chat uh, we can even like uh, spin up some uh, separate meeting for individual consultations if you would like and otherwise just please take it at your own pace we will check in from time to time to see like where you are going if somebody needs to have something explained but please jump in as you will go so that would be everything from our in introduction so please start working on it uh basically in about 20 30 minutes i will check in if i should start uh, coding it too with you but really, I don't think it's necessary to that matter because it's really self-explanatory. I did uh, went through whole workshop yesterday, so I know that it works. So okay, thank you for visiting our workshop and good luck. There is no response in the chat, so really nobody, even that person in the bed, doesn't want me to go really over this workshop with you. Okay, then. then please take it at your own pace. We will be still in this meeting. We will be checking out uh, periodically. And if you get stuck, just uh, write something into chat or ask. Yeah. 
Martin, there is a question in the chat. Is there any link to a GitHub repo instead of the zip? Uh, so we should probably answer. <laughs> yes, there is a, a GitHub repo with the completed project, but you should probably only use the repo uh, if you are stuck, because uh, otherwise you should start with the zip and then adding stuff uh, as, the, as the workshop goes. Maybe I have a wrong chat then. I don't see the question. Hmm. Probably you need to switch from event to session. There is a uh, yeah, there are two Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. You So, okay, I will use session chat then. <laughs> Thank you, Dirka. So uh, just before we will continue, I would like to point you to the main, and now I will be posting to the session chat. 
because I, I was recommended to the main Quarkus site, which is Quarkus.io, where, and maybe I can share this too, where when you scroll totally down, hopefully, you should see how to join Quarkus community. And somewhere here, you will see that we are at uh, Zulip, which is a communication platform, a platform where you can find all three of us, usually all the time. So the, thank you for the link, Vladia. So you probably won't be able to finish the full workshop in just two and a half hours, B but if you, would like to finish it, definitely you should. And if you get stuck or something, you should, uh, you can always catch up, uh, catch us later on the Zulip chat if you will have any questions. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.
Okay, so I am being told that you should see me normally, but for some reason I am frozen on my side. So hopefully at least you can hear me. Uh, can you please write into the session chat uh, at least plus one or something that I am working on uh, the workshop so we know how many people we are actually following? Only one? Come on. Great. Okay, so it is very quiet for us. So I would like to go with you slowly, see where I can go. Uh, if you want to go on your own, please just mute me and do it on your own and write the questions to the session chat. Ladia and Martin will be monitoring that so they will answer your questions if you will go. And if somebody wants to follow with me, Please go ahead. My camera is frozen, so hopefully nothing will be showing <laughs> that shouldn't be. <laughs> but OK, let me share my screen. Well, just Martin, uh, your camera is not frozen on our side. We can see you just. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's frozen only on my side because <laughs> my home internet. So <laughs> hopefully I will not show something that I shouldn't. <laughs> OK. OK, so you should be able to see my screen. And at least I can see my screen moving. That's great. OK, so I will basically go slowly at my own pace. And uh, we'll see where I will get. So what we are going to create in this workshop is basically a set of uh, microservices, which will be streamlining fights between the superheroes and supervillains. It consists only of uh, five services, if I remember correctly, one for hero, one for villains, which is basically uh, CRUD operations on heroes and on villains, villains, fight service, which uses both hero and villain to uh, get uh, random heroes, random villains to fight. UI is an Angular application that is just showing a nice pictures of the of everything and uh, and basically, we'll give you an option to click that fight. Well, basically, Prometheus is also a standalone service, but it's not something that we are going to call ourselves. If you are familiar, uh, if you are not familiar with what Prometheus is, it's a application service which is basically polling individual applications for uh, metrics or some statistics, and can then display them in really nice structured way. And we also have our own uh, statistics service, which uh, will show some statistics that are specific to our application uh, services. We have also here Kafka and Zookeeper. We will get to it when we will get to it. And also we have a UI for that. I thought that is integrated in the statistics, but yeah, maybe I forgot. That doesn't matter. So when we will finished, hopefully successfully our application should look like this so we can trigger the fight get new fight fighters etc okay so hopefully all of you already went through software requirements i will skip that because i should have everything installed so basically just copy paste this into a terminal hopefully this is big enough for everybody hopefully Vladia, martin can you it's, it's very small Oh, come on, you are on your home computer, right? <laughs> OK, so uh, basically, just copy paste these commands to your terminal. You should see something print for every of these commands. So I have Java 11 installed. I think that I don't have this installed. No, I don't have because I don't need to have Graal installed because Quarkus uh, in the current version that we are using in the workshop already comes with an option which 
has a fallback if for you if you don't have GraalVM installed and it will trigger the GraalVM uh, image build inside uh, Docker container. So this is what I'm using, but this only works on a Linux machine. So if you are not on Linux, you need to download and install Graal. But I'm not doing it for some quite some time now. Maven, I definitely should have, because I'm working with it. Just please make sure that the Java version that you are using in Maven corresponds to the Java version that you are printing here because this can be different if you have multiple Java inst installations on your machine. And uh, girl, girl, I should have on Linux. Docker version. Uh, actually, if you are on uh, Fedora, I think 33, 34 plus, we don't have no longer have an option to use Docker. So for me, Docker actually is Podman. In the, in the background, I just have a alias installed. So when I type Docker PS, for instance, then I have a, a Podman running on the background. And I have something here. So let me just do it. So we have a clean environment. Okay, and Docker Compose, that's the same case for me because I, I am using Podman. So in the background, there is, instead of Docker Compose, there is Podman Compose. Okay, so I should have everything installed so I can start working on the workshop. So first thing that it tells me is I should download the zip, which I already should have installed, uh, downloaded. So I can just unzip it here. Go to Quarkus Superheroes. Quarkus Superheroes. Yes. And I can open it in my favorite IDE. I guess this is also small. Do you go into presentation mode? Uh, So this should hopefully be now big enough. Uh, this is just a wrapper around individual services that we will be coding. So we, you can open it, open them all in uh, one, I, one uh, ID window. Basically, when you are coding microservices, of course, you usually don't code them all on one machine. There are different teams writing them on different uh, in different environments. But this uh, allows us to have only one window open and we can uh, do everything in one place. So, okay. Moving on. Uh, okay, so I unzipped it. Here we have the whole application, how it will look like in the end. We will be creating individual st services step-by-step step as we will be going. And yeah, all of this will be Maven projects because Quarkus prefers to use Maven, but not necessarily. It will be Maven Java projects, but with Quarkus, you can do also Gradle and also Kotlin or Scala, if that's your thing. And we should check that we have uh, empty ports because we will be running quite a few things. So let me just check this because I actually have something running here. Okay, so AP eighty one. Wait, this this. Secure. Let me try this one more. Okay, 8080 is empty, empty, empty. Um, hate this keyboard. Okay, I think that's more than enough. Then the one for Postgres should be empty. That's good. 
commit the US running on 1990. Great. Zookeeper. And. Great. So I should be ready to start working on this. OK, so first thing first, we should build what they provided for us. OK, so that's green. That's OK. Warming up Docker. So uh, hopefully everybody is familiar with Docker. Basically, it will allow us to start a bunch of containers that we will be using as our infrastructure in the background, mainly database. Uh, Prometheus and Kafka. And actually, in that infrastructure directory, so I will go to infrastructure directory, we have Docker Compose uh, and Docker Compose Linux. So, depending on your system, please use the one that is relevant to you. Since I am on uh, uh, Linux, on Fedora, I need to use Docker Compose Linux YAML. With this app-d, it will basically take all the containers that are defined in that. Uh, yeah, I can check it. Docker Compose Linux, what is there? So basically, if you are not familiar with Docker Compose, it's just listing individual Docker containers that you can start and stop or manage in a unified manner. So basically, here we will be starting Postgres, Prometheus, Kafka, etc. And you can like set some defaults uh, for these containers inside one file. So if you want to start all of these containers, you need to run it with up command. But if you just run it like this, without the dash D at the end, it will start them running in the for, uh, for, foreground inside your Linux terminal, which we don't want to do. With this minus D, it will just detach them to the background. So if I uh, OK, guys, uh, Martin, Ladia, if there will be some questions to what I'm talking about, just jump into my speaking, please. Docker Compose is basically, yes, there is also Podman Compose for Podman. So it's basically the same thing, just on the Podman, Podman side. Usually with Docker and Podman, you can use the same commands in the same manner. I think that Podman is fully compatible with Docker, because really I am using uh, Docker as an LES for Podman on my machine, because many scripts are still using Docker. But Fedora decided that we will be not using Docker anymore. So when I run this, with minus D, it should start all of that three, four containers in the background. And if I now run Podman PS or Docker PS for that matter, uh, you should see uh, all of that uh, four containers being started and running. And we can actually, I think, leave them running in a, for the whole duration of the workshop. OK, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that I am good because now it runs for me. There is also Docker PS, Docker Compose PS, but I need to use the correct YAML, which will get me basically the same information. Just this is useful if you have more containers running because Docker or Podman PS will take everything on your machine, but I killed everything. And if you want to stop it, there is a command down and RM, which I think that it, RM doesn't exist in Podman Compose anymore because down will directly remove the containers. But yeah, that doesn't matter. But I don't want to really uh, stop them because I think that I can keep them running for the whole duration. We'll see. Because we might have some conflicts going on and we will get to it. OK, I don't want to download the whole workshop. So hopefully, I am ready now to start finally developing. And the first microservice that we are going to develop is the VLAN service.
So this is pretty straightforward CRUD application with REST API utilizing a Postgres database. Very common use case, I believe, in user applications. So what we are going to strap, uh, start with is actually create the uh, VLAN Quarkus application. For that, Quarkus comes with a really nice way how to initialize applications which is Quarkus Maven plugin, where you can basically create a Quarkus application with similar mechanism as Maven archetypes, specifying a bunch of uh, uh, properties for your workshop. So we are uh, specifying group ID, artifact ID, class name that will be generated for us, which will be a villain resource. Also, JAXRS or REST path on which this class will be exposed. And we can also specify a list of extensions directly when we are creating the application for uh, which will be included in our application. And we will get into what extension is in a minute. So let me just really quickly create that application and open it in my ideas. So, uh, so I have here REST VLANs, but if I want to use it actually, I need to help idea and tell her that we have now also REST VLANs and just the import from XML. So it is recognized as Maven project. And basically what I will start with is POM XML that is generated for us. And basically, yeah. Properties are not that interesting. What is interesting is here the dependency on Quarkus, plot, Quarkus bomb, which is basically an artifact which lists all the versions of, of individual, not only dependencies, but extensions that are compatible with a particular, uh, particular Quarkus version. And then in our dependencies sections, we don't need to use basically the version tag. So you shouldn't see version here anywhere you because everything is pulled from that Quarkus pop. So what Quarkus extension is, Quarkus by itself is really small. I think that core itself is only config and uh, CDI implementation arc. And everything else on top of it is based on the concept of extension. So you will only add into your application what you need to use in your application with the sense that your application then, uh, yeah, I think that 2.7.0 was already released. The workshop needs some slight updates, but we, we will get to it during the weekend, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so basically what we added on that command line, if you remember, was as easy reactive Jackson. So what this adds for us is basically a Maven dependency for that extension. We don't need to specify the version because that is pulled. And in this concept, now we can use REST easy, which is a implementation of JAXRS from Red Hat with uh, reactive extension. I don't know what I should, reactive flavor of REST easy. We will get into reactive in later sections. And basically that's it. So you can list here either manually dependency on individual Quarkus extension, or you can use that uh, minus D extension. There is also an option, Oops. Maven Quarkus list. Come on, don't freeze on me. List extensions, I think, which will, yeah, if I can type Quarkus. No. Where is it? Also with extensions. Ah, yeah. Uh, what I need to do is CD to REST villain because there I have Quarkus plugin. So with Quarkus colon list extension, you will get the list of all available extensions that you can use in your application. And I don't even want to scroll it on top because there is too many of them. So you can check individual extensions that you might use. What is Quarkus really good for, or where it shines at least for me, is that on quarkus.io, there is also an option to 
create your application if you prefer clicking and not using uh, command line with the, this kind of UI. So you can specify the individual extension, which was like the rest easy, reactive here. And I can just tick the checkbox and download a zip, which will be basically the same application as I generated uh, on the command line. But what I wanted to show you is that, come on, I want to go on to Verkuzio back. Here in Learn tab, you have this guide section, which is basically a set of, I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes step-by-step uh, -step guides for individual extensions. So if you know that you want to use something like, uh, let's say, reactive messaging, you can just search here for reactive somewhere here reactive messaging with Apache Kafka. And here in less than 15 minutes, you should be able to get the idea how to use that extension when you are using. So you will be creating actually a application, really small application with that extension and the guide will show you how to use it. So I think that Quarkus Guides is something which is really great for, for getting starting experience with Quarkus. Okay, so moving back to the workshop itself, uh so i already added it to my uh pom xml so that should be good yeah this is not that important how the directory structure will look like in the end and let's then start so here is basically what i was talking about how pom xml looks like how we define dependencies and extensions Quarkus Arc, as I said, is one of the core uh, dependencies, which uh, provides dependency injection based on, on CDI, context and dependency injection specification. And basically that's it. Then we can start. So the first thing that we are going to actually try is to play with the dev mode, I think. So uh, what we have, right now in our generated application is that single class, maybe I can make this better, VLAN resource that we specify on the command line. If you are not familiar with JAXRS, please write your questions to the chat and Lady and Martin will uh, answer them. But basically here we are just saying that on path slash API slash VLANs, if you do get, we will produce a text plane with this message. So. What is another great thing about Quarkus is uh, so-called Quarkus uh, dev mode or live reload mode, where you can start Quarkus with this Quarkus colon dev. And what it does, it will allow us, allow us now to basically have Quarkus automatically being restarted for us uh, on uh, HTTP invocations when we will be changing something. So I should be now with curl, what was it? Curl, curl, VLANs, be able to call our service. So I am calling my application, which is started on localhost 8080 on that path slash API slash VLANs, which maps to this and with get method in curl if you don't specify anything so the string hello as easy reactive is returned i actually prefer to use a different program which is called HTTPE, ie so i will be using this more so the lanes so basically this will do the same call as i did here just it will structure the output more nicely uh, <clears throat> can I interrupt you for a while? Yeah, sure. Think, Good. Uh, yeah, the command line is nice, but maybe we could show at least for a few seconds the Quarkus development console we have in Quarkus because it's more convenient for many users. So just just show the console and and basic stuff. Sure thing, but we are jumping ahead. I think the development console will be there later. <laughs> But it doesn't matter that much. That much. So on localhost 8080, we have default index that is served by our application. But if you go to Q slash dev, 
Such queue is reserved for Quarkus specific endpoints. So on slash queue slash dev, we have what Martin is calling uh, the dev console or dev UI. I hope that this is what you meant. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, what you have is a really nice overview of individual installed extensions that you have in your application. So as I said, configuration and arc is usually in there. And you see here that we also have REST Easy Reactive, which will allow you to go inside these individual extensions and to actually do something with them or check what they did. Like, uh, for instance, here we have all beans that uh, arc processed and CDI bean is basically an object instance that is managed by arc or by Quarkus, really easily said. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, Martin, do you want to say something else to this? No, 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 this is enough. Because I, I remember that actually later on we will be talking and directly looking into deleted beans and et cetera into Arc in this. So, yeah, you're ju jumping ahead, but that doesn't matter. Okay, so, uh, okay, so going back to our dev mode so still my application is running in the dev mode so if i repeat that call i will still get rest easy reactive but what that live reload mode gives us is that i can actually change this just uh, in my ide save that file go back into id and just repeat the same http call and if you check here quarkus application will be really fastly recompiled restarted and you will get your changes directly reflected. So you can actually call this nt22, just save the file, repeat the calls, and you are getting this back. And where this shines is because usually you are not using curl or HTTP, at least I don't think that many people, except for me, because I like terminal, use this. This is a normal HTTP call in uh, that basically browser does. So if I go here to appy, the lanes, I can do the same thing. So I will shoot and just hit F5, refresh the page, and Quarkus will be restarting in the background. So in this sense, you are just refreshing your application in a browser, and your application is really fastly recompiled. Changes are reflected. So basically, you can start uh, developing your application, and you don't need to stop it until you are finished with it, which is really nice. So this was development mode or the mode that I just uh, described and moving up to testing of your application. So basically in that generated uh, project, we also had a bunch well, to test dependencies for uh, GUnit 5 and REST Assured, which is uh, not mandatory, but uh, Quarkus already comes with the integration for REST Assured. If this is not your choice, it's still possible to use something else. But uh, yeah, there is also some management for sure fire plugin, which is, I don't think, that important. But we already have a generated test in uh, so it's a test Java, actually two tests. The first one is uh, basically a test for the generated uh, resource class. It will call that exposed path and assert that we are getting some uh, response, which will now fail. What is important that in Quarkus, you should annotate your test with Quarkus test, which will allow Quarkus basically to start Quarkus application in the background before your test is run. Also allows you to use uh, dependency injection inside your test. I don't know what else. Can you help me guys? <laughs> uh, also, I think that without it, that uh, rest assured integration doesn't work, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah okay. So exactly. Also, if you don't annotate it with Quarkus test, this uh, won't work. Now I can just call the rest assured given, and uh, this will automatically be uh, configured for my test port on which my started Quarkus application will be running, which by default is 8081, I think. Okay, so this is basic unit, te unit testing, and we also had this native VLAN resource IT test generated, which just extend our already existing test. 
And you see here that we are just executing the same test, but in native mode, and we have this native in each test annotation. We will get to native mode later, but basically this will run the same set of tests as we have in VLAN resource tests for the generated native executable when we will generate native executable. So I think that we should now show, yes, another great feature of Parkour, which is called continuous testing. So when you are in a dev mode, and probably some of you already seen this at the, at the bottom, that we have the test post and press R to resume testing. This is what we called continuous testing, which basically allows you to continuously rerun your test when you are reloading Quarkus in dev mode. So if I press R now in my terminal, just R, you see that tests are starting, we are running our test and it fails because we are returning hello devconf 2022 2 and we are expecting that easy reactive. So if I go back into my source, no resource, sorry, test, and fix this here. Oops. So the test actually correctly asserts what is being now returned from uh, our application. And because I am doing this only on via one monitor, it isn't looking that cool. But when I saved the test, the Quarkus was restarted. And you see here that now all tests are passing. And we see here also that all one test is passing. So this is what that continuous testing is for. So you are continuously running your tests in a dev mode. Really nice feature too. Okay, so I showed this, I fixed the test. And now, yeah, of course you can run the test normally as you would do with normal compilation if you prefer. So if I stop the dev mode, I can just run name and v test and this will just normally compile my project and run the unit test. Okay, so this works. Oh, going back, packaging and running the application. Basically, this is normal as with any other Maven project. So I can just do Maven, Maven, the package. So I'll again run the tests. And now in our target, we have a bunch of fix, uh, things generated. You see here that we have some jar generated, but this is a normal output of Maven. This is not something that you can run. What you can run is actually placed into Quarkus-app directory. So in our target Quarkus-app, we have Arcus de Juran jar, which is already a runnable jar, which you can run with Java minus jar. But let's try that. So with Java minus jar target Quarkus up Quarkus run that dash jar, I can run my application. I can verify that it's running the same way that it does in Quarkus dev mode. And maybe one thing that I forgot to mention in the dev mode that when you are starting Quarkus, you will get the list of all installed uh, extension printed, which is sometimes useful if you are propagating something which you don't want to propagate or you are missing something that you would like to include. And basically that's it. So this is how you can really fastly start with your application. One more thing that I will mention that if you would move this uh, runnable jar somewhere else. You need to also move this lib directory, and I'm not sure if also app nowadays. Can you help me, Martin or Vladia? Because I think that nowadays we are splitting some of the dependencies also to app directory. There is only app. Okay, so maybe just lib then, because in this lib, main, you have all of that dependent jars that your applications need to actually use, but, and that runnable jar is actually rather small. So this is very useful if you are using Docker or something, because you can put 
uh, the dependencies, which doesn't change that much into second last layer and uh, push this somewhere. And then you are only rebuilding that smaller, oh, come on, smaller Quarkus Ranjar, Ranjar 618, uh, and pushing just this. So you have a smaller network throughput. Yeah, Martin is correct. <clears throat> but maybe we should also mention that uh, we also have a bunch of generated bytecode uh, jars. So it's not only this runner jar and lips, but then in the Quarkus directory, uh, in the target, if you can take a look at the Uh, yeah, there is this generated bytecode jar and transform bytecode jar and so on. So if I'm pushing something, I need to push runnable jar, lib folder, and this Quarkus folder, right? Yeah, yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, so moving on, so we run this and successfully run this, so we need we can now move to transactions and ORM. Are there any questions to what I am doing? Because I see that there is some movement in the chat, but hopefully guys are catching up with everything. Yeah, I, I think that we figured out to answer all those questions in the chat. Great, thanks. OK, then I'm moving on to transactions. Really nice topic all the time. OK, so since we want to make a CRUD application that will be persisting something to a database, uh, we actually need the transaction, because otherwise we won't be able to persist anything. ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping. And if hopefully everyone is familiar with this, this is basically uh, mapping of your Java uh, classes to uh, entities in your database. This comes from uh, JPA, Java Persistence API specification, and the implementation that we are using in Quarkus, but basically whole Red Hat is called uh, Hibernate. And here we have how to install Postgres dependency Hibernate with Panache and Hibernate Validator. Panache is something which is really interesting because if you ever used uh, ORM or Hibernate, I don't want to say uh, Hibernate, let's say JPA, uh, there is a lot of, uh, I don't want to say unnecessary, but there is a lot of boilerplate that you need to write in your uh, Java classes to get a fully functioning entity into your database. So the same guys that made Hibernate came with the idea and they create a project Panache, which just removes a lot of this boilerplate and your code is way cleaner and we'll get to it in a while. So here we have, uh, here we need to add additional extensions for to our applications that will be actually driver, driver for uh, Postgres. Uh, Panache and Hibernate Validator. So I will just copy this command. And in the same way as I did previously listing that all extensions, because I want to show how you can get to it. In the end, you have uh, basically this uh, line printed that if you want to add an extension, you can use this command, Quarkus colon add extension with minus the extensions artifact IDs. So basically, this is exactly what we have in the guide. And I can just list the individual extensions, which I should be able to find somewhere in that long list, and just really easily add them with this command. And we can see that all of them were installed. Uh, but you already know that what it actually does is add a Maven dependency into your POM XML. So if you prefer to manually edit your, here we have your DBC Postgres, Hibernate Validator, Panache. So if you prefer to manually edit your POM XML, you can do it, but there is also this possibility. Okay, so going back, yes. So you can actually also manually edit the XML if you prefer that option. And basically now we are good to go. Now we can uh, 
use these extensions and connect to the database. So to define an entity with panache now, this is not traditional JPA entities, what you can do is just really this. So let me just copy this class. We'll just copy it and then I will explain what it's inside. I really had time typing the line for some reason. Okay, so let me just copy paste it into my ID so it's better visible. So uh, to create Panache entity, all you need to do is annotate it still with entity annotation as similarly as you do in traditional JPA, but it needs to extend this Panache entity or Panache entity base, if I remember correctly depending on whether or not you have you want to have your uh, id of your entity generated or you want to somehow influence influence how it will be generated because now i am getting the id from the parent class and in panache entity base i don't have that id so depending if you want to have id or not you instant either panache entity or panache entity base and then all you need to do is just define public fields that your entity will use. And if you are familiar with normal JPA entities, this actually needs to be private. Fields needs to be private and you need to provide a public setter and getter, which is just by would private because then you have the same thing as you have with public fields. So basically our entity will have these five fields. Uh, basically this is nothing that interesting. You can also use other some JPA uh, annotations. You see that this is coming from JavaX persistence if you would like to, but I don't know which all of them are supported, which all of them work. But uh, again, if you would like to see what is possible to do with this extension, all you need to do go to Quarkus guides and find Panache and you will see basically the whole configuration reference and basically a list of things that you can do with that extension. And if you won't find the answer there, then we have Zulip chat or uh, GitHub discussions where you can ask these kind of questions. Okay, then we have a bunch of uh, bin validation uh, or hibernate, well, bin validation uh, annotations, which are, I really don't want to go into inside that. This is from another uh, specification from now Jakarta E which you can use to somehow constrain the values that you are putting into a database. And we also got a those thing, but it doesn't matter. But you see that basically we could, we should be able to reduce this whole class to five lines if we didn't do any form of validations and etc. which is way more concise than what you would need to do with uh, traditional JPA. Okay, so, but this is, of course, op opinionated approach. I know that some people don't really like this kind of public fields. I personally really prefer this kind of, I think it's called active record pattern. We will get into it, what you can do with this. So actually to use now our entity, if you're familiar with JPA, you know that you need something which is called entity manager and call some methods on that. But with Panache, all you need to do is basically call uh, basically methods directly either on instance of the VLAN that you will create or some static methods that directly come with uh, your entity class and you don't need to really manage anything else. So basically you only need to manage transactions on top of that, but we will get to it. Uh, you don't need to inject entity manager, but I think that you still can. You can still use traditional SQL like thing is if you would like to, but it's not necessary. So this is called active record pattern. You are directly calling uh, static methods on your entity classes. So basically this will basically translate to select star from VLAN in the background somewhere. And I will get, oh, heroes. <laughs> okay. I will get a list of VLANs back. And I need to make another, another note, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so 
there is a bunch of these methods that you can use. This is not, again, the point of this workshop to show you everything that you can do with it. But if you check the Panache guide, you will see all of them in really nice manner, how, do, how you can use it. Again, if I want to persist, I will just create the instance and I directly have a method persist on it. So I don't need to inject any kind of other infrastructure to call persist. So going further down, what we need to do now is to add our own uh, business method to VLAN entity. So I will just do that. I will just add here, find random, which will use the static methods from uh, VLAN. And basically I will get back only one random VLAN, which will which is really interestingly generated because I will find all instances, then I will page them for pages of size one, and I will just get a random page. <laughs> Not sure if this is the best way how to do this. But yeah, <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay, so with that, I should have now an option to get find, find a random villain if I will need to, because I will need to. So Hibernate needs some form of configuration, and with that, I, we will be getting to how the whole of Quarkus is configured, which is really unified manner. And in Quarkus, all of your main or default uh, configuration lives in a file called application properties in source main resources. So I see here that I want to configure to drop and create database on startup. So I will go into my so main resources, application properties, and just paste this here. And now I am basically still not ready to start because I still need something that will call that methods on, uh, on uh, my VLAN entity and will actually start the transaction. So this is yet another, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Jakarta a specification called JTA which will basically allow you to manage transactions with the boundary, which is the start and end of the method on which you have this at transactional annotation. So uh, there are different types of transactions. I don't need to waste time on that. So we will be now creating our first custom CDI bin, VLAN service. Let me do that. Villain service. Villain service will be a CDI beam. And uh, again, I don't know how much I need to go into what CDI beam is, but basically, if you annotate something with some scope, like here we have application scope, there is also request scope, dependent, singleton, etc. Uh, you are telling Quarkus or in our case, ARC CDI implementation, that this VLAN service class will be managed by the Quarkus or by uh, your framework, your runtime. So that means that I will not be manually instantiating VLAN service. ARC will do this for me, and I will use that instance of VLAN service in my other CDI beams. Uh, Actually, when you use application scope, this just uh, means that there will be only one instance of this VLAN service created for the whole run of the application. The request scope would create new instance for each HTTP request. And we are also saying here a transactional annotation with this required field, which basically just says that by default, if uh, you have uh, transaction or required. If you enter a method with a transaction already started, uh, your method will be using that transaction. And if there is no transaction, a new transaction will be started. So this is a default because it's on a class level. And then you can override the uh, transactional on individual methods if you need to do that. So transactional required would be used, for instance, on this Persis VLAN or update VLAN. But on this free method, we override it with supports, which is another type which says that if there is a transaction, then uh, I think you join it. But if there is no 
transaction, then you just do your method without transaction. And that makes sense because for just select operations like list all, you don't necessarily need to use transaction, but if you're calling it already with the transaction, then I think you should. Okay, so we have now this VLAN service and we don't need to do with, basically we have a CRUD operations on that and we can move on to something more interesting. So we have application scope, yes. Accessing a database in dev mode. So we should start application in dev mode. Uh, so I think that we have now already started uh, Postgres database. And it doesn't matter because this is our production database that I have started in my Docker container. Maybe I can just just to show what, what I mean. And you believe me, it was in infrastructure, Docker compose down. So I will just now kill all of that uh, services that we started with Docker compose because I want to show something else. So I have no containers now running on. Uh, my machine. If I now start uh, application in demo, and yes, you don't need to have Queen Compile in this, but I am using it for some traditional reasons. I don't remember actually why. I'm using Quarkus for since version zero point something, so yeah, th this might be very archaic. Uh, so if I start Maven Quarkus then what will now happen is something which we call Dev Services. If you are familiar with uh, test containers, which is a framework which allows you to start uh, Docker containers from your uh, Docker uh, from your Java applications, so basically Quarkus now uses something similar in your dev mode and in uh, tests. If you have extension like we have extension which is trying to connect to a Postgres database and Quarkus is starting in dev mode and it sees that there is no Postgres database started, it will actually start one for us. So our application can actually connect to some dev instance of container Postgres, which we can use. And you should see here somewhere that the services for default data source Postgres was started. And if I now check all the containers running on my machine, I should see that there was some Postgres that started for me. And if I now kill my dev mode, then hopefully the container is killed again too. So in this sense, I don't really now need to care about my application not working because there is no dependency that I'm using. I use this a lot, especially with Kafka, for instance, because again, if I will have just extension that is trying to connect to Kafka, it will just pin Kafka container for me on the background. A really nice feature. So again, if I started in, in dev mode, oops, I again have different podcasts started for me and my application actually connected to it. So we should see here somewhere that we are connecting to it. Okay. so. This would be Dev Services, another really nice feature of Quarkus. So, yeah, I already said that. And we are moving on to our VLAN resource. Just reading if I can just copy paste this all together. Hopefully, yes. So, in our VLAN resource, we have just that dummy uh, DevCom method or string returning method. So this should be already fixed. So I will send a PR in the morning. So we will add a, just a bunch of another methods, which are again, basically CRAT plus uh, random generation, which will use our fine random VLAN and our custom business method on our entity. And with that, I should be able now to test it. Mm. Let me see, because we don't still don't have anything in the database, but I should be able to already call it. So if I get all VLANs, which is on same endpoint, sorry. Okay, so if I just call now empty VLANs, I should hopefully get empty JSON. Yes, because we don't have anything in the database yet. So, dependency injection. 
I already talked about that. So if you want to use something which you or somebody else declared as uh, CDI bin, your application, because I told you that you are not instantiating it yourself, you need to inject it with Javax inject inject, yet another Java E specification. And we need to say that this is a logger from Jables logging, I hope. I hope, yeah, it should be. It should be Jables logging. So, in this sense, if there is this inject uh, uh, annotation in some already defined CDI bin. Quarkus or Arc will look for all classes of this type with uh, which are defined as. Uh, CDI beans. It will write the uh, find the right instance. I will. I am no. I am skipping a lot now, Martin. Sorry. <laughs> and it will put that instance into my field, so I can use it directly in my application, and I don't really need to worry about it being null or misconfigured or something similar because I know that I will get the correct instance in here. And in the same way, I can inject my VLAN service. So just to really quickly repeat that inject needs to be used in already CDI, uh, CDI and where am I putting this into villain service? Nobody is telling me. I need to put this into villain resource. I don't want to inject villain service in villain service. You are coding and speaking. Yeah. So uh, now I can use this villain service in my villain resource and I don't need to specify that scope in uh, JAXRS or REST uh, classes, because this is automatically deducted by Quarkus that this is a CDIB. So I can actually put here some scope. I don't know what is the default nowadays. Application scope or request? Do you know? Martin or Laja? Uh, sorry, what was the question? Do you know what is the default for JAXRS resources <coughs> on scope? Yeah, by default, it's singleton, which is basically uh, something like application scope, except uh, except a little bit more performant. But it's singleton. singleton also means that you have only one instance per your application. But you can also mark uh, your resources request scope, for example, so that a new instance is created for each HTTP request. OK, so yeah, as Martin said, if I want to just override this, I can just like say here, request scope, and now it's request scope. But by default, it will be single part. OK, so now I can actually, and I have it already here. That's interesting. And now already use these services in my application either like this or you can use it in a constructor if this is the only constructor that there is then when uh, arc will be creating the instance of your own resource it will try to find the beans which are declared as parameters for constructor yeah but maybe if, if you choose to use the constructor injection you should remove the inject uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just or like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I prefer field injection. <laughs> OK, no problem. But yeah, sorry, I didn't notice that it was already in there. <laughs> so yeah. OK, so you have it already. Uh, you have it also in the workshop itself. So you can see here that either you use an inject on the field, which we call field injection, or you will use that constructor injection. but. Martin is actually the author of ARC, so if he says something about CDI, you should listen. And then I rather deleted the constructor injection, so we don't mix it. OK, so moving back to SQL, or SQL, uh, Panache and ORM, uh, what Quarkus actually allows us to do is to pre-populate the database with some default data when the application is started. And you can do this by just creating import SQL file in resources directory, where you have normal uh, SQL statements, which will add some data into the database. And in the guide, we have a really big, I think 500 or something like this. Uh, Repopulated VLANs, which we can just 
adhere into that import ql file and now if i will go back into my terminal and just repeat the same call to get all the vlans so i will make uh, dev mode restart quarkus hopefully if i typed everything correctly i should get back around 500 pre-populated vlans which are picked from that import sql okay again something which i use a lot when i'm uh, uh using panache okay so moving up to testing uh hopefully everyone is okay with um, what i'm doing and if there are some questions that you are asking in the chat something that you want to ask me directly Okay, so then we can continue. I hope that I will be able to finish at least VLAN in that two hours. Okay, so what we should do now is actually create a little bit of testing for uh, our uh, SQL integration, I think. So I will just copy paste this into the VLAN resource test. Okay, that's quite a lot of tests, but again, we have this Quarkus test annotation, which needs to be placed on test. This is something specific to, yes, JUnit 5, which will allow us to somehow order the test. And you see here that we are just basically calling that uh, methods that we are exposing now in a VLAN resource, and we are asserting that some actual VLANs are returned. And trying to find where they are pre-populating database here and they are not because they are actually then trying to create vline i think no that they are actually attempting to get like all the villains so there is 581 of them then we are creating a villain then we are updating that one created villain and then we are removing it and asserting that we still have the same number of villains again something that we don't need to go into much detail but now in my demo because i am already connected to a database running in the background i should be just press r and why only one test Hmm. Maybe I should not. I need to restart it for this to be picked up. Because by default, Quarkus in dev mode only scans uh, your uh, CRC main Java folder and CRC main resources, meta resources, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully I'm right. So since my import is sql is not in these parts i think that i need to restart that mode to get this picked let me just try that and we'll finish for wait for quarkus and database to start and yes now i have eight tests so hopefully they will pass Yes, green, so we are good to go. Okay, and then moving on, building production package. So what we haven't really talked about yet uh, is uh, that Quarkus is able to start in different modes of operation depending on how we start Quarkus. And depending on that, we can use different configuration, for instance, that uh, will influence the execution of our service. So when we are actually starting Quarkus in dev mode, we are using something which is called the profile. But if you start Quarkus uh, normally, already package application with Java minus jar, we will be using something which is called a prod mode or prod profile. So uh, in that sense, 
What we can do in our configuration is actually this. So in my properties, I can use this percent followed by the name of the uh, profile that we want to use that configuration for. So basically here I'm saying that this config should take only place when we are running application in prod mode. So when it's starting in dev mode, this configuration is not used or in test mode for the matter. So I can override the same property like here that for dev, it would be something else. And for, oh, come on. And for test, it can be also something else. You see what I mean? We can have the same property several times and different property will be used depending on which, in which mode you are running your Quarkus application. So uh, yeah, we don't need to use this right here because we, what we only need to say is that these properties should be only used in prod mode. And why is that? Because here we are really connecting to a production database that is running separately for us somewhere else. In our example, in that the Docker Compose that we are running somewhere in the background. But in a dev mode, we want to connect to that uh, dev services database that is started for us, also in test. What I forgot to mention is that I don't know if I'm running it in continuous testing, if I'm connecting to the same Postgres, which was started for the services. But if I just call it with Maven test, I know that, again, some Postgres would be started for me just for the test. But I'm not sure in that mode if it's reused or not. Do you know? I think that it's a separate instance because like if you start your application in the dev mode, you have one instance for the dev mode and and another instance is uh, set up for the tests because otherwise it would not make much, much sense. Standing, standing too long, so I need to sit. Okay, so moving on. Uh, okay, so this prod will be, again, as I said, only used when we are running our application in uh, prod mode. So what I need to do now, because in uh, previous steps, I stopped the container. So I will stop the dev mode and hopefully my uh, podman is empty. I will again start production Postgres database from our Docker Compose. Okay, so now I should have somewhere some production Postgres started on. 5432, which is configured here on localhost 5432. And now I should be able to uh, compile my application and I will just compile it without this to save some time. And now I should be able to run my Quarkus up, Quarkus run jar which will now use that percent prod profile or percent prod properties and should connect to that uh, database. And I should still have everything pre-populated as I had. So we have 581 villains. So, but now we are connecting to our production database, not longer in the demo. This is something which is a normal production run of my Quarkus application. Okay. And I already did that. Okay. So I may be a little overrun because now we are getting to configuration. So I already talked about it. If you don't use any person something uh, prefix in your configuration, so you will just type your configuration normally, it will be used in all profiles. Of course, you can also override it in some profiles. And then if you are running in a not specified overridden profile, then the default will be used. 
So what we are configuring here is just some uh, configuration for uh, our console. So if I now start it in dev mode again, because of course I don't want to repackage my application every time that I change something. That's not something that Quarkus is for. And you can already see that I just uh, darken the Quarkus log a little bit and change the how the log messages are outputted. Nothing too fancy. More interesting is configuring the Quarkus uh, listening port. So basically, you can say that Quarkus uh, by default it runs on port 8080, but 8080 is a very much overloaded port. So usually you want to push it somewhere else. And actually on 8080, we will have our main UI running. So our VLAN service will be running on port 8084. I'll put this into my duration. And this is one of a really small number of properties that actually re requires you to restart the dev mode because you are running your application now on different port. So we need to restart the application. And you should see here already somewhere. What is it that we are starting on port 8084? So if I now try again port 8080, I should get connection error. But if I try 8084, I am getting bad uh, result. And with that, yes, I already showed that injecting configuration. So. What we used so far is always prefix with this Quarkus prefix, which means basically that these properties are something which is specific to Quarkus. But uh, configuration in Quarkus, which is based on uh, microprofile config or other implementation, which is called smaller config, allows you to use this same form of uh, configuration for specific stuff to your application. So you can directly use anything that is configured here in your application. And to do that, you can basically just, just paste to fill in service this time. Uh, it nicely. Use this at config property annotation, which is coming from the microprofile specification. In Quarkus, you don't need to now use at inject because in Quarkus, when you are using something which is called qualifier, which is this config property, you don't need to use at inject. Again, small but really appreciated feature, uh, which in which you need to specify the name of the configuration property that you want to use. So we are seeing level that multiplier, and optionally you can also specify the default value, and you are using it as a normal injection. So again, Quarkus, when it starts, it will find the value of this uh, property and will inject it into my field. If you specify it like this, so this basically, I'm saying that I need this configuration for my application. If you don't specify it in your uh, application properties or somewhere else, somewhere else, so Quarkus won't find this value, your startup should fail. I think will fail because you don't have this configuration, but you can also inject uh, optionals here, for instance, for optional values. In that sense, you will just get uh, optional empty. Okay, so yeah, it's basically written here. So if you start it without this, uh, this uh, value, and I hope that I won't break it totally. So if I repeat that call, I will get Quarkus restart. It didn't save it. Didn't save it. Why is it working? Ah, yeah, because I have default. So if I would delete default, so now I don't have it configured, my application will start because I don't have config value for level multiplier. So going back, I have default. What I can do now with it is actually use it somewhere. So in uh, persist VLAN, VLAN service persist VLAN, we will just multiply the level. Persist VLAN. So we will just use that uh, injected configuration somewhere. And what we can then do is in our application properties, specify this property. 
by default overrides the level of all uh, lanes uh, to be just half of their actual level. So they are a little bit bigger. So heroes win more. And if we now try to use these, so I will now copy paste this because this is more advanced not which I don't want to replicate. We should see that we are specifying level five, which we are posting to our application, but because our in our application properties we specified level multiplier to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, our oops created uh VLAN should have only level three because it was multiplied by 0 0.5. Of course, if you would like to override this somewhere else in your prod profile with something else, you can again use the profiles. Actually, in this kind of applications, and if you check again the configuration guide on Quarkus side, you can see that uh, application properties is not the only way how to specify these configuration values. By default, you can also use uh, environment variables or uh, system properties when you are starting your application. So uh, basically, you can ship some sensible defaults in your application properties. But for instance, if you are running in cloud, like OpenShift or Kubernetes, you can specify environment variables for particular pods or running of your container that will override this configuration in the cloud, which makes sense. OK, so with that, Quarkus should have warning. Hopefully, enable continuous testing. So let me try if our tests are passing, just to be sure. No, it's actually, I have failing test. And what I need to do? In my application, let me specify what I did this uh, property for the test profile. So in a test, it's still one. So because my test expect one. So if I just no, I don't need to rerun them because I see that all of them are passing now. Because now in test profile, the test level multiplier is one again. And I saw the question, and as Ladia is saying, uh, that conf dynamic configuration is generally not encouraged, but it is possible to do if you would like to do it with microprofile config. Uh, OK, so moving on. We are finishing at full 12 or at half? Nobody knows. Full 12. OK, so next one on the table is Open API. I'm almost in the half past. That's nice. Open API, again, uh, separate specification coming actually from some external body. I don't remember from who. It is basically YAML specification of your REST API, which you can pass to somebody which are going to who is going to invoke your service that will directly describe how to invoke your service and what kind of responsive responses to expect so for that we have again a separate extension which is called small Array open api small Array is basically a separate project or set of separate projects which are implementing micro profile specifications there is also a micro profile open api specification which we are using in quarkus and also in other Red Hat products so usually when uh you are checking something uh, uh particular or like if you are familiar with micro profile there is usually a mapping one-to-one -to, -one to micro profile specification and small Array project so Small Array Open API implements like a profile Open API. Again, if I want to add Open API uh, extension into my application, I will just copy paste at extension command. I don't need to stop it, but yeah, doesn't matter. I shouldn't enjoy it. 
think that I don't need to stop it nowadays because I can just in different terminal navigate into REST lens and paste it here. I think that this will also trigger Quarkus application. Yeah, it does. So actually, you don't need to stop it if you're just adding extensions. And now I should see here that I have small array open API extension in here. And with that, we will directly get this. No, I can open it here. Oh, I don't want to download it. I will already out of the box get some pre-generated open API document. And you can see here that all of the points that we are exposing in uh, our VLAN resource are here with uh, actually available methods that you can call on them, HTTP methods, sorry, and also responses which are allowed. And what should they like uh, return? So what that small API, open API uh, Extension allows you to do is to somehow tweak this open API document that is outputted from your application. And uh, yeah, we, what we also get from uh, open API is Swagger UI, which is generated from this open API document. So if we now go to the dev console that we already showed, we should see here small right open API extension. And we see link to the open API, but also link to the Swagger UI which hopefully everyone is familiar with Swagger is just translation of that open API document to, for me, already nice UI, but I know many people will disagree, which you can directly use in here. So I can try it out, execute, and in the background, it will just do the same thing that we are doing on command line, basically curl. And we have all of the results here. Okay, so, oh, not here, where am I? So, uh, blah, 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 I already did. So, again, what you can use with Smaller Open API is a set of MicroProfile Open API annotations, which you can see here. Again, this is not the point of uh, this workshop to show you. There is also open API guide on Quarkus site if you want to dig uh, more deeper into these annotations and what you can do with this. And there is also MicroProfile open API specification that you can read, of course. So I will just copy paste this to VLAN resource. And in VLAN resource, I will copy paste this. Yes, and this one from Java RS. So you just see here that we are using something to specify different API responses, how the operation should be called, etc., etc. For this particular VLAN resource, for this particular JAXRS resource. But what you can also do with Open API is customize the information for the overall application. And for that, you need to create actually an application, a JAXRS application class which by default is uh, not required in uh, Quarkus because Quarkus is able to play in application. Quarkus is able to generate this for us. However, if you want to use Open API, MicroProfile Open API specification mandates that this kind of uh, general information must be placed on application subclass. So you need to create it, but it's intentionally empty because Quarkus doesn't really need it. And here you can specify, as you can see, title of your application, version of your application, context, servers on which your application can run. And what this in turn gives us, if we check again the open API document, we should get a lot of more information in our document. So we see here the title, version somewhere, servers, etc., for individual uh more responses for individual uh endpoints 
and also somewhere in the end schemas for individual objects that are expected to be passed to our application, etc. And also in our Swagger UI, if I refresh this, we should now get VLAN API in version 1.0, some description, servers, which we can specify from that. Also, I don't want hello, we here see returns all VLANs from the database so that's taken from the operation. So we can tweak this in this way, if you prefer to. Really, if you want to, I think that you can do a lot of more things with Open API, but I'm not using it that much to be that familiar with what everything it can do. And yeah, we can create an Open API test. API is returned. Where should I put it? Just, I will just do it so we are following it, but you can see here that we are just asserting that we will get the 200 from OpenAPI on an endpoint. The test. It's not picked. Tests are not picked. Um, so I should have nine now. Let's try this again. Yeah. Hmm. So maybe I found the bug because I thought that this was happening before. But okay, I was able to finish one microservice. So, any questions to what I did so far? This was really small CRUD application connecting to a database. If I wouldn't be explaining it that much, you can see that it's basically four classes and I have fully functioning CRUD application connecting to a database, which I think is pretty nice. Any questions to the VLAN? I see that Martin and Ladia is pretty busy in the chat. That's good. Okay, so we still have 40 minutes, so let's see what we can do going on. I don't know if I want to explain that much about Quarkus itself, because I think that today at 5 p.m. we have a so Quarkus session, which hopefully will cover this kind of stuff. But I think that this image is really nice, so I will just cover this. Uh, why is Quarkus so fast and small? is basically because it's doing a lot of stuff during build time. So when you are compiling your application and then as Martin was already showing you that the generated bytecode, for instance, is pre-built during your application compilation. And then it's just run during your application runtime. While usually when you are starting, and I don't want to name any other Java runtimes, uh, but other Java runtimes, you usually need to do this kind of stuff and processing of classes, lookup of the CDI beans, I don't know what else, <laughs> uh, during runtime when you're starting your application. So that's why Java usually have a really long startup times. While Quarkus is, because of that, able to compete with even Go, definitely with Node. And I think that in some cases, even with Go. Okay, I will just skip this because yeah, we don't need to go through this all. Displaying banner, yeah, this is really really important to do because every application and I read this in just in this guide should have banner nowadays. My application doesn't. So what we can do now is to create another class, VLAN application lifecycle. So let me do that. Billing application. Oh. 
So, what we are trying to do here with uh, VLAN application lifecycle, again, it's a CTIB, which will be displaying our own custom header from here, is basically what we are trying to show you is how CDI handles firing of events and observing of events. So Quarkus, when it starts up and when it shuts down, fires a CDI event, startup event or shutdown event, which your application, basically any CDI beam can listen to in this way. So you will just use it observes startup event. And basically this method will be invoked by Quarkus when the Quarkus is starting, similarly when stopping. And in this sense, if I now go back into my application and I will just re-trigger some endpoint so Quarkus is restarted in that mode. We see here already, but not nicely because it's too big, that our method printing that a CR was invoked. And again, if I would stop Quarkus that mode, we would see that uh, the is stopping, but I don't want to do that, do it right now. I think it's clear enough. What is actually nice to see is going to the dev console as we already mentioned uh before into the arc extension which is implementing that cdi which is basically responsible for triggering our observers and we should be able to see now our observers observer methods in here and we should also somewhere see which events have been fired by Quarkus or your custom uh, events that are fired. And we should see here that startup event was fired at this time. And thus we know that our own start callback observer should be called. Okay. I think that this is everything that I needed to cover here. And okay, configuration profiles. Where am I? Configuration profiles. Okay, I will finish this section and then I will need to take a brief pause because I'm talking for two hours. Okay, I already talked about configuration profiles. It's that percent something uh, prefix that you can use in uh, uh, your configuration. By default, there are these three at uh, dev running in dev mode, test when running test, and prod running when you are running in, when you are not running in development or test mode. So basically, Java minus jar or in uh, native executable run. Uh, you can also get the information about which profile you are running directly from Quarkus. I don't need, think that this is necessary to put it there because it would just print that we are running in dev profile. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we already use it in a test multiplier. And mm -mm -mm. this is nice that uh, also it is possible for you to create your own Quarkus profile when uh, you create your custom profile, like if it's called foo, then you can specify the profile with the Quarkus profile property like this. And then I can use in my uh, application properties something like oops, percent foo level multiplier, something, something else. And I can use it with minus d, minus dash minus d, uh, Quarkus profile full. Okay. Okay, so the last thing in this section is how to build uh, the native executable. So what is native executable? If you are not familiar with uh, GraalVM, it's basically a way how you can uh, compile your Java application into really uh, Linux uh, run runnable file, Mac runnable file, or on Windows.exe file, which you can directly run. And this functionality comes from GraalVM, 
so basically in the in theory any java application should be compilable into the native executable with GraalVM, but it's not that easy to do it. Uh, because GraalVM, when it creates this native executable, needs to do basically static analysis of whole run of your application, because it needs to generate runnable by code, bit code, I think. Uh, so, uh, you often need to help Graal to tell Graal what actually your application is doing, how is it doing, you are not able to do some things with Graal. And this is where Quarkus again shines for you because that extensions are not only, uh, extension mechanism is not only great for you to uh, specify what exactly your Quarkus application depends on and make it smaller, but it also allows you to in that extension itself, specify how that extension code should be utilized in, uh, uh, for instance, GraalVM builds. Also, how it should uh, behave during build time, what should it do at runtime, etc. So extension developer or someone who creates extension can have a really, uh, can intact the execution of your application for the stuff that is relevant to that application. So for instance, you can imagine that if you need to put some annotation somewhere for GraalVM, your extension can do it for you. So uh, Quarkus directly comes, and we already have this generated for us in our Pom XML somewhere at the bottom with this native profile, which will directly allows us to uh, compile our application into native. And you can see that already here, we need to specify some properties uh, which uh, we need for uh, GraalVM to be successfully compiled. Well, basically, this is the, just the name, but log manager, I guess, is necessary. And basically, all we need to do to compile our application to native is run package minus p native. Uh, so, for this to work, you should have your uh, Graal VM home set, and you should also have that native image tool installed, which was in the original installation guide. However, I saw at the beginning, if you are following me, that I do not have Graal installed. Actually, I just echo Graal VM home. It doesn't exist. This is computer. So I don't have GraalVM or the native image to install my machine, but because I am on Linux, what I can do is maven package minus p native. Maybe I should again do skip test, but I want to show you that the test run in native mode too. So it will take a while. <sighs> Okay. So here is that interesting stuff. So you can see here that Quarkus wasn't able to find native image in my system. So what it tries, it tries to fall back into the container build. And because I am on Linux, what it actually does, it will pull image with GraalVM installed for me, copy my code into that image, run the build into that image, and then just copy that final binary back to my system. But because this image is Linux-based, Ubi, which is universal-based image, it will only output the Linux binary, which only, of course, works on Linux. If you are running on Mac or on Windows, you need to really download and install Graal and then it will pick your GraalVM from your system and will output the binary which is specific to your distribution. But because I am on Linux, I don't need to install GraalVM for hopefully a long time from now. If I can, I really like to like 
you know, like outsource version handling to somebody else. So usually uh, native compilation takes quite some time, even for small applications, because as I said, you need to process whole run of your application. But what you will get back is really small, really fast, and especially in nowadays uh, serverless architectures, it's something that can really compete with uh, definitely Node and possibly in some cases getting very close to Go or similar languages. So when this finishes, and it's taking, taking longer than usually because probably I'm sharing screen. It's not that long for such a small application. I think I can get on my machine to something around one minute for simple CRUD application. So if I now list what was generated for us, so you, you can see that we had this dash runner application, which is already runnable. So I can just run target rest vlines runner. And you see that our application was started. It connected to that uh, database, production database that we are running. And I should be able now, not open API, that's not that interesting. This was. Try delete this. If at the VLANs, I will get the same functionality. And you can see that it will start it just in uh, half a second. So, okay, so this would be native executable. If you are not able to build it on your machine, that's not a big deal. Uh, we can help you later or uh, ping us on the Zulip and we can help you figure out how to run native build on your particular system. Usually on Linux, this, which I showed you, should work out of the box, hopefully. OK, and with that, if you don't mind, I will take a slight pause, and I will be back in five minutes. Martin and Ladia can answer any questions that will be in the meantime. There's a question about uh, build time, the time of build of a native binary in the event chat, not in the session chat. But I, I noticed that. And you need it quite a lot, <laughs> honestly. Like if, if, you, if you saw the output uh, when, when Martin was building a native image, it includes how much memory it, it, it eats. And it typically, for a small application, gets to something like five gigabytes or so. Uh, well, mo most most of it is for the, the JDK. So if, if if you have a small application, bigger application, that will not make too big of a difference because the JDK is still much bigger. Um, but but yeah, I, I would recommend not starting, not trying to build a native unless you have at least eight gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, maybe we can also uh, 
mentioned that uh, Martin's demo, uh, the native image started in like a half a second, which is not usual. Like in most cases, your application will start in a few milliseconds. But because of uh, too many open tabs <laughs> in Martin's uh, uh, web browser and maybe even some other reasons, it was way too slow. I would say it was slowed down mainly by screen sharing. That thing slows down everything. And you cannot hear me. I'm saying that uh, I usually have 200 tabs open, so I know that it's faster in screen sharing. <laughs> We have 25 minutes left. I'm not sure if I want to get really deep into the next part because reactive is not something that I want to go, you know, like just touch it slightly. But maybe I can like talk a little about reactive in the meantime, if there are no more questions. Okay, you can like answer normally. Yeah, that that is a complicated topic. I, I I'm afraid I don't have a, a straightforward answer that would be satisfying to anyone. But that's basically how how the GraalVM compiler works. Um, and I don't think that you can do anything about that. I know they are working on that because they 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 see that. The Memory content of the native image compiler is a huge problem for the community. But but I think that waiting is the only thing you can do. Unless you're a compiler expert and want to contribute a sizable portion of your time to the GraalVM project, of course. Um, I mean, yeah, so sorry to disappoint, but I, I don't think you can decrease it in any Anyway, but in any case, if you have some CI machine, for instance, that is more performant, that should also be an option. So I would be just curious for the ones that are actually doing this on your self pace. Uh, where are you right now? In which section? Not sure if anybody is listening, but I would be curious like how much you can do actually in the two, uh, two and a half hours of the workshop. Everyone is coding so much. Yeah, Ladia, maybe you can discuss this a little more, like why it's why why like native is attractive, but why people still should consider running it. Running Quarkus in JVM mode? Yeah. Um, right, so, so I think native is attractive because of the of the instant startup time, right? The certain classes of applications benefit from that greatly. Like if you wanted to write a command line application, you would these days you would do it in Go or Rust. Right, for that, those are compiled to native and they start instantly, right? And, and if you run a command line application, you don't want to spend a second waiting for the JVM to boot and compile all of uh, half of the JDK, right? So that's, that's why 
you, th that's why native is popular for certain use cases. And, uh, at the same time, the the traditional JDK with its runtime uh, profile guided optimizations have its benefits as well, right? So if you are writing a traditional uh, enterprise application that you would normally write using Jakarta EE or Spring, you can write it in Quarkus and run it on a, on a normal normal JVM. And you will benefit from that. But you don't really care that much about startup time. You don't really care if it, if it takes half a, half a second or three seconds, right? But you care about the peak performance, both throughput uh, and latency. But then for that, the the adaptive optimizations of regular JDK will trump the native image uh, when you give it some time to, to compile everything, right? So, so native is great for certain use cases. For instance, Quarkus has a, has a great uh, story for building command line applications. But at the same time, running on, on a regular JVM is beneficial for other use cases. Right, so I mean, if if native is confusing for you, you can forget about it, and you will be fine, and you will still benefit from Quarkus a lot. I think that's that's all I all I want to say. Maybe also in the serverless. I'm not sure if people are compiling. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I think I, I mean I'm I'm no expert on serverless. I never used it, but from what I know, uh, well, you you pay by seconds, right? You, so so the start of time is crucial. In what, uh, and though uh, quite often serverless architectures spawn new instances, and again you don't want to wait uh, a second or, or or two or three. Until until it starts. So so whenever startup time is of great importance, you want to use native. Whenever throughput or peak throughput is is of utmost importance, and you can spare a few seconds at the startup, you should go for regular JDK. Yeah, maybe also mention that CPO is not the only measure you would like to observe, because another one is memory consumption. Because you very often in cloud environments, memory is expensive. And this is where Quarkus in both in JVM mode and in native mode shines. Right. When, when I think one other reason, one other use case where native makes sense is horizontal scaling. Whenever you get into a position where scaling vertically is no longer an option, and you need to start scaling horizontally, then native becomes interesting as well because of its low memory consumption. So if you have like a fixed amount of memory, with native, you can stick more instances of the application into it. Right? You can, you can get like two or three times more, maybe, maybe even more uh, instances of the same application into the same memory space. But if you look at the performance metrics or the, the, the graphs of the Quarkus IO website, you'll see that we're measuring uh, what, 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 the, the metric that we're comparing on is memory density. But how many applications you can get into the set into the fixed amount of memory, and when, when, which is interesting when you need to start scaling horizontally. Thank you for reminding me that there are graphs on Quarkus side. So you can see that basically what we did with that VLAN service, RESTful Scratch is starting typically in 0, 0.0 milliseconds, something. So really, it's just because I am sharing screen and on hopping, I guess it takes a little longer on my machine right now. Yeah, also be careful with these numbers and, and graphs because it will always depends on what your application does and how many extensions you use and so on. So this is really just the basic REST graph example 
Um, but it always depends on your application. And benchmarks are always tricky. Yeah, but I still think that you will not get to 0 0.5 seconds, even with more extensions. Yeah, definitely not. That's a good question. And actually, we would get this uh, get there really with this reactive section. So please continue. Uh, basically, reactive applications and especially reactive messaging, smaller reactive messaging, directly implements publish subscribe pattern reactive strips. I can maybe just scroll a little to show you how this works. Uh, it's not that important. Connecting to Kafka, maybe. No. So in uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. In small reactive messaging, it comes with this incoming and outgoing uh, annotations, which basically allows you to plug uh, method computations inside to channel uh, processing. So basically, in here, we are taking uh, individual values from fights channel, which is our data pipe, and do some mapping, which we then push to team stats. And in the background, uh, this is using uh, uh, reactive streams implementations that we also have in Smaller Eye, which is called Mutiny. And if you are uh, interested in this publish subscribe patterns in Quarkus, tomorrow, I think, I don't know when, but tomorrow somewhere I have a session separately only about how to do reactive with Quarkus and microprofile. Yeah, building reactive microservices with microprofile. So I will be showing that tomorrow using Kafka, yes. Because usually Quarkus isn't really pushing you to directly touch the stream. Uh, you see that in this way, you can like really nicely structure processing of the streams because you are just like from saying like from which channel you are consuming values and where you are pushing them. Or you, if you don't use that outgoing, then you are just consuming. Or if you just use outgoing, then you are basically a producer producing values. No, you are not blocking. Actually, when you are using uh, reactive, uh, maybe I can scroll this up because I think it's described in here somewhere. Actually, Quarkus is reactive at core. Everything in Quarkus is reactive. Even blocking stuff is reactive. We just block on top of that. So I overdone this, maybe here. I think it's written somewhere in here, but I cannot find it uh, this fast. But basically, as you have that extension that we use, the rest easy dash reactive, there is also just rest easy, which is a blocking version. Uh, also, we have uh, panache reactive. I don't know what else we have reactive. Well, basically, Everything in the background is 
reactive and you as a user can choose whether you want to use reactive programming model or imperative depending on what you should choose actually that the hero and the hero is actually reactive so you see here that instead of a hero or villain as we did in a villain resource we were returning okay response and it doesn't matter we could return villain directly here if we are doing okay villain uh you are basically using imperative model so this method will block when you are but you as a user will call it but if you uh what is it if you use this uni which is uh coming from that mutiny project uh which represent yes yes use uni instead re represent some re reactively asynchronously computed value which will be returned in here uh this should not block and in that sense quarkus is able to process different http requests for instance in the meantime when you invoke this get random hero so actually yeah I, tomorrow, I don't think that I will go into this kind of detail, but uh, Quarkus, if you use the REST Easy Reactive extension, will, depending on the return type of the method from your JAXRS resource, either run it reactively, which means on event loop thread, or it will switch, the, switch it to the executor thread where you run blocking code. So even if I would use just hero here without uni, I think it would be running run in blocking manner by default. But as Vladia is saying in the chat, you can also use add blocking annotation to manually force it to run on executor thread. And you can also use not blocking. Yeah, there is also no blocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that at least in some extensions, I know that I run into this with Panache somewhere. If you now try to run uh, some blocking code on uh, event loop thread, uh, it will automatically throw some extension that you shouldn't block on event loop thread. That actually works generally. That, that's, a, that's a vertex feature that checks if the event loop is blocked. Um, and if it's blocked for more than two seconds, I think by default, then it will it will give you an exception in the log. Yeah, but Martin's point is a little bit different because you can actually, whenever you try to perform some logic, you can check whether you're executing on the event loop thread. So there is more in Quarkus. But again, this is slightly more advanced topics and you usually shouldn't care that much. If you are returning uni or uh, multi from the mutiny, which is encouraged uh, reactive streams implementation in Quarkus, you are safe that you will be running on a uh, low thread. Okay, we are getting to the end. So are there any more questions for us in the remaining six, seven minutes? You can take that, guys. Uh, I'd like to add something. Uh, thank you for this great session. Uh, if you want to, and it's all, not only for presenters, but also for the attendees, we have a work adventure platform. Uh, there is a session room number six, and there you can further discuss your topics around Quarkus. I will send a link to the chat. And it's a easy to use platform. I will use uh, your avatar to move on the map. And you can interact with different things. So 
please take a look, try it, and enjoy it. So thank okay, you for that. Thank you, Lukas. And before we will go, I just posted again a link to the Tulip chat where you can catch us even later after the conference if you would like to finish uh, that workshop on yourself. And we will have still some questions, or in general, any questions basically around Quarkus.